that. Let me back up a little bit so I can talk about our objectives. Um, uh, so the first thing we want to do for today is we want to find the room. We've accomplished that. That's good, right? Okay. Uh, we want to figure out how to log on remotely. Uh, for those people that are on online only now, that they've managed to do that. Hopefully, uh, 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 if they have issues with it, uh, we'll work that out with them. Uh, we want to get an introduction to the main software that we're going to be using in this course. Uh, and that's going to be Excel, which is a spreadsheet program, SPSS, which is a statistical program, and I, I'm also bringing up R. Anybody ever heard of R, program called R? R is an open source program. Uh, it's a piece of software, a programming piece of software that's been developed by statisticians and programmers uh, uh, that are, are, are contributing their time to the effort to uh, put this together. It is a robust, it started out as kind of a minor uh, uh, statistical package, and it's turned into, with all these add-ons, I believe people have been working with it, into a really robust statistical system. It's free. You can download it to, for free. You can learn how to use it on uh, uh, from videos on YouTube, from a whole bunch of other free training sources, and so on and so forth. I bring that up in case anybody, again, that wants to be a little bit of a geek and likes programming and wants to play around with that. You can use either SPSS or R, uh, but we will, for the class, be supporting SPSS. So if you use R, you're on your own, but uh, uh, it may be a little bit better learning experience for you in some ways, especially if you're into program. Um, get, we're going to get familiar with the syllabus, what the rules in the course are, what what uh, different things are worth, uh, percentage of the course that uh, is going to be uh, the grade that's going to be uh, for homeworks and for exams and so on and so forth. Then we're going to actually get into the very, very beginnings of statistics, um, particularly understanding data types. The type of data that we work with is going to have an enormous impact on how we're going to summarize it, how we're going to display it graphically, how we're going to analyze it. So what kind of data are we talking about? We've got data that's like names and addresses, right? That's called nominal data, right? Hair color, gender, nominal data. We can have uh, data that's numbers. We can have uh, blood pressure, uh, 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 milligrams of uh, vitamin C, nanograms per deciliter of lead uh, in blood, and so on and so forth. We can have numbers. Uh, we have specialized numbers, numbers that are discrete numbers. They're counts, in other words, integers. Uh, we can have scalar numbers where they have a scale like blood pressure or uh, body temperature or something like that. Uh, and then we can have other kinds of data, which is kind of a crossover between them, uh, uh, which is kind of a name, but it also has some other property that gives it different values. Those are called, called ordinal data. Okay, And that can be something like grades, like uh, good, fair, poor, right? We, good is better than fair, fair is better than poor but we don't really know what those represent. The pain scale, one to 10. Your nine on the pain scale may be somebody else's seven, right? And if you, if you tell me that right now your pain scale is nine, and an hour later you tell me it's seven, um, uh, that may not be the same difference as being going from five to three. See, there's no way, to, we, we can see the order, but there's no way to really quantify it like with a scale or number where we know that 10 is double what five is, right? For a real, for an actual real number. Okay, so that's another kind of data, but it's gonna be important to us because even though it seems a little kind of trite and boring right now to like spend time trying to like classify data like this, later on it's gonna pay off when we have to look at, st at collected statistics and we have to figure out how, what, what's the appropriate way for us to analyze this stuff. So really, it really help out later on. And then we're going to maybe do a little bit of it. We're going to do some exercises in Excel and so on and so forth. So you get a look at what it looks like. How many of you guys would say are experts in Excel? Okay, good. I like that. That's excellent. How many of you guys are, re are a real novices in Excel? Really don't use it very much. Great. This is going to be good for you then. Okay, so we're going to really start kind of at the beginning. Hopefully, I won't bore people that have used, that use it every day and stuff like that. But maybe it's, you might even learn a trick from here too, as well. Even if you used it before. Okay, our textbook, our official textbook, 
is going is an open source textbook. You don't have to buy it. You can download it for free. You can buy printed copies of it from Amazon, color or black and white. I don't think you really need to color, to tell you the truth. Uh, or you can just use the PDF version of it. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's like any other test textbook. A lot of times it'll parallel the course really closely. Other times it'll kind of seem like it really doesn't make sense with what we're doing in the course because not really you know it's not specifically designed for use with SPSS and so on and so forth so there's going to be a little bit of areas where it really helps and other areas where yeah it's interesting reading but may not be that important but it's free so that's a great thing because some of these textbooks uh some of these textbooks are even less useful and they cost three hundred dollars so I'll put it that way Okay, that's, that's the link where you can download it. You can also uh, just Google open intro statistics and it'll take you to that website. Uh, comes as a PDF file. I like the PDF version. Because PDF versions, you can like type in, like you can do a search, you don't have to go to an index. You just type in a you know, phrase or a word or something like that and then see where stuff is in there. And it really makes it a little bit easier to use it as a reference. Okay, we heard, we heard enough about me, we heard enough about that. Uh, what are our, uh, our expectations of you? Not, I'm not assuming, even though if you guys have some statistics, I'm not going to assume any, pre, any significant previous knowledge of statistics. Um, hopefully you stay involved. Uh, there is 10% of this course is uh, uh, a 10% uh, 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 of the grade is participation. In the classroom here, that's pretty easy to judge because we're looking at each other. Online, most of that participation will be by a forum, by discussions forums on blackboards. So it would really help if you guys get involved in this. By, by discussions forums, I mean people that actually really interact with each other, students, not just me. So if you have a question, um, uh, there's, I think, I think there's pretty close to 30 people in this class. If you have a question, about something specific uh, in the homework, for instance, and you email it to me, there's a good shot that one of one or two or 10 of the other 30 people in the class are gonna have that same question. So it's much more efficient for you to post that question to the discussions forum so that other students can put their, have their input and that I can also see it and, and respond to it as well. It's a much richer experience and a much more efficient experience because uh, trust me, at some point I'll get overloaded with these things. And in my time, my, my, I try to make my response time within 24, 24 hours, maybe 48 hours at the outside of emails. But uh, you know, when I get a lot of them, you can understand that things get backed up. So that those discussion, that discussion forms really help a lot. Um, uh, and any of the homework, um, uh, uh, I, I do not mind, I, I don't, obviously I don't want you to copy each other's homework. In other words, just get a uh, do Word document and just submit that and cop just change your name on it or something like that. But I have no objection to you collaborating on the homework. In other words, working on the problems together, figuring it out, exchanging information on the discussions forums, or if you get together uh, uh, in groups or something like that. That's the way, I, when I took this course, uh, uh, in the year 1915, I think. Uh, that's the way we would do it. A bunch of me and nurses and nutrition and occupational people, we'd get together like before class or something like that. In the we had a cafeteria. I, yeah, I've got a little one here. We'd get together and we'd uh, uh, work on our statistics homework together, right? So I have no objection to that. On the exams, of course, those you're expected to do all on your own. Okay, there are two exams possibly three, two exams that are non-cumulative. It's only going to cover the material up to that point, and then the next exam from that point up to the uh, day of the exam. Uh, there's going to be six homeworks. When it says six homeworks, it's really going to be more like 10 or 12, except the six homeworks, I often break them up into parts, like homework 3A, 3B, 3C, kind of like cover, separate the topics, make it a little bit more understandable. So really, it's more like, say, 10 homeworks or something like that. They're not enormous homeworks they're not things that are going to take you you know six hours to do or something like that they're modest um uh the more practice the better though i'll be giving you other examples that you can work on your own practice and stuff like that and i might even reference some uh problems that are in the textbook the textbook has problems at the end of each section uh and it also has the answers to the problems for those sections as well so it's a little bit of help as well uh, as far as the end of the semester is concerned, again, you're going to have a, a, a choice of doing a final project, 
Um, for those of you, if we're going to get a lot of people that are going to show up in person, which would be great, uh, then the final project is going to be a it's going to be in the format of a poster presentation. Anybody here ever gone to a poster presentation? Like, a, yeah, you've gone to like a, a conference or something like that. You've done one. Oh, okay, good, excellent. So, so the idea here is is that is is that you go to these these conferences and they may have dozen a couple of dozen speakers that uh, will address the conference and you know communicate their research and so on and so forth. Uh, but then you have another hundred or two hundred researchers that they don't have time for that kind of presentation. So they set up a conference room or something like that with rows and rows and rows of these large boards where people put their uh, research, their uh, what their objectives are, what their data looks like, what their conclusions are, so on and so forth. And they stand near these things. And as you uh, walk through these rows of these, bo these boards, these bulletin boards that are basically on, on uh, display, as you walk through them, if you see something that interests you, you can read that post, you see that person's uh, 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 research, and you can start, stop to chat with them, ask them questions, and so on and so forth. I'll give you pictures of it, and so on and so forth. You're not going to be doing anything that looks like anything li like the magnitude of the kind of poster that you probably put together for a conference. It's going to be something fairly simple where you just got, it's going to be like limited to, say, uh, s seven or eight uh, 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 eight by 10 pieces of paper printed in large type so that you can, and with graphs, so that you can read it if you're standing a few feet away from it, right? So it's going to be pretty modest, but it's going to be a different way to present your project instead of just a, uh, just a report, right? And it'd, make, it'd be interesting. And it's a good exercise for you to get an idea of how these things are put together. Uh, so you'll have a choice of doing that, or you can just simply do a third exam which was, again, non-cumulative, just cover the extra material. Our class is from 110 to 340. Most of these are broken up into, most of these kind of classes broken up into a lecture section and a lab section. Um, and you said so very often they'll have one lecturer, usually someone that like presents the material uh, uh, in a complicated manner so that everybody freaks out. And then another person writes a lab that explains to them what was what, what they've told in the lab in the uh, lecture section? Unfortunately, you just have me, so I'm going to have to confuse you with the lecture and then re rescue you with the lab myself. Right? So, so that that's kind of the structure we're going to stick to. I may, in fact, in some cases, instead of doing it myself, I may give you some videos of other professors that have done lectures that I've recorded, and let you watch those lectures just as a just as a second way of seeing you know, sometimes when when you get the same thing from the same person all the time uh, uh you don't see another perspective and when you hear hear it in a different voice maybe it helps a little bit to understand it so i'm gonna i'm gonna try and provide those as well uh okay so you can get to me through blackboard discussions through email my email address is anthony.devito at sph.oh excuse me i'm gonna use my hunter email a devito at hunter .cuny.edu, A-D-E-V-I-T-O. Uh, when you send me an email, please put PH750 anywhere in the subject line because my, my mail program is set up. It sees that in the subject line. It grabs it, highlights it, puts it into a folder for me. So it makes it almost impossible for me to miss it. I get so much email that, like, trust me, it's going to be, if I don't recognize your name or if the topic, you know, doesn't catch me. I may not realize that it's uh, it's relevant to the class. So if you do that, it really help me find uh, lo locate your emails. Uh, individual meetings by appointment, either here or uh, uh, actually even better. We this whole thing that we're doing with go to meeting, where you can see this stuff in the back. Um, uh, uh, we can also do that person to person. I can set up a video conference so that we can video conference uh, for another class on Thursdays. From 4:30 to uh, to 5:30, 4:30 to 5:30. Uh, I think that's the time. 4:45 to 5:30, 4:30 or 5, somewhere around that. Around 4:30, 5:30. I hold an online help and review session. Okay, we're covering basically the same material. 
So I'm going to send you guys links to that as well. So if you want to piggyback onto that, you can just join that help session. You can type in comments, you can ask questions and so on and so forth, and we'll have a live interaction. Even though there's a lot of people in those classes, usually, especially uh, when it's uh, the beginning of the semester, not that many people show up to listen to those. They'll be recorded as well, and I'll give you the links to the recordings, but it'll be an opportunity for you to ask me questions and uh, or tell me that there's an area there that you don't really understand. Can we go over it again? And I'll just address that directly. Right, so that's I'll give you links to that as we move forward. I'm not going to do it this week since everything's so new, but starting next week, uh, we'll have that Thursday session. Okay, uh, hopefully, a supportive learning environment, whatever that is. And I, I reply to your emails as quick as I can for sure. Okay, so what are the major components of the statistics that we're going to be learning? Right, well, first of all, you know inevitably one of you one of when i say one of you probably five of you is going to come back to me in a year or so and they're going to say uh, uh professor devito i'm an adjunct lecturer by the way technically i'm not a professor but all students call me professor because i think it just makes them feel safer so anyway but you don't have to worry about that with me um so you're going to say to me professor devito i've collected all this data i need some help analyzing this right that's not the time to think about that the time to think about how you're going to analyze data is before you start collecting it, how you design the study. So the first thing that we're concerned about in statistics is design, how to obtain data, what data we want to obtain, what we're trying to demonstrate, how we're going to get that information that we're going to need at the end in order to analyze it. So design is really the first major component of statistics. How, how, what's our study, how is our study going to be designed? What data are we going to collect? How is it going to be organized? Description, summarize the data that's collected. Um, a million, you know, you go out and you collect a million numbers and, and words and so on and so forth. Uh, they really don't mean anything until you organize it in a form that uh, helps you understand uh, uh, what's going on in a population, for instance. And finally, uh, inference. After you describe these, uh, the information, you want to take that information and draw conclusions from it. And that's called inferences. That's when you make this. That's when you actually run your statistical tests. You start making decisions and predictions that uh, 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 will have some public health impact, and so on and so forth. And that account for the uncertainty that's always there when you're measuring, when you're trying to predict what a population is like when you're only working with a sample from that population, a small number. Of of people, for instance, from that population. Okay, timeline of statistics. Um, this is really, you know, the, the, whoops, what did I do there? There it goes. Okay, this is really kind of, uh, 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 this was originally like one strip, one very long strip, so you can kind of go to the right, then come back around to the right, and so on. But it gives you kind of a background of statistics. The real point here is, is that statistics, statistically in one form or another, has been around for, cent for centuries and centuries. Uh, one of the earliest is the use of uh, uh, 450 BC, use of basically average and stuff like that. So that's gonna be our first topic here is gonna be average, but you can like glance through this and get an idea of some interesting uh, uh, anecdotes and the progress of the idea of how to evaluate uh, 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 statistical information. Okay, some, let's see, some uh, main definitions that we're gonna look at here. Uh, the idea of population and sample. Okay, when we're talking about a population, we're talking about the entire group. Okay, now we could call it the entire group of interest. So, like in other words, a population could be all of the people on Earth, could be all of the people in the United States, it could be all of the students at Hunter uh, between uh, uh, 18 and 27 years old that are female. Uh, that have taken uh, 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 more than one course. That might be our population. You define what your population is. Most of the time, we our population is too large for us to measure everybody. Not always, right? There is a time when we measure everybody in a population. What's that? Is there any time that you know of when, say, we measure everybody in the entire population to get our data? Right, census every 10 years. What year is it? 2018? Coming up in a couple of years, right? Year and a half. 
right? So the census, right? We actually get information, family size, occupations, all kinds of information uh, on the census. What's one of the issues with the census in New York, particularly this year, particularly now, you know, in this political climate? Yeah. Not wanting to come forward. Right. Yeah. People concerned that they don't want to be identified. They don't want to take part in the census. So we wind up with an undercount, especially in cities like New York, San Francisco, and so on, that have large immigrant or undocumented po populations. Uh, we traditionally can get uh, traditionally in a situation where there's an undercount. Now they actually do go out physically send counters out to encourage in those neighbors get encourage people to take part, but inevitably wind up with a. Uh, an undercount. Now, statistically, we could do a sample, do a really careful survey in, in you know, square block at a time, randomly select around the city. We could do a survey and we could say, um, you know, based on what we know about those blocks, we can predict that in New York City, there will be a 3% undercount because of these people that we really had to ferret out that wouldn't normally be counted. Right? Why don't they? Why don't they amend the census to take up for that? Make up for that? Anybody know? Why don't they just use statistics to adjust for the undercount? What, what, where did they describe what the census is? Anybody have an idea where the census, where the information about what a census is in the United States? Why we take it every ten years? It's in the Constitution. It's literally a part of the Constitution, and it requires a physical count. You can't. You can't use statistics to correct it at least not until it's an amendment, if there ever is, right? So physically you have to count, right? So if you're not physically counted in that census, you're not counted at all. And that census is used for a lot of stuff. Well, outside of populations, we rarely get a situation like that where we're able to get information, say, for all of the, uh, all of the children in New York City uh, that are uh, uh, older, than, I'm, not, I'm avoiding saying six-year-olds, because there is, a, there is a possibility we get all of the information for six-year-olds because there's a certain age in public schools or in, or in schools in general that are required to test children for lead, I think, in New York City. I don't know if that's current or not. Anybody know about that? What the policy is now with the Department of Health? Yes. Only in high-risk areas. No kidding. Okay, I thought it was all children. So, so we really don't have an idea of how many children in the other areas in New York City what their average blood lead level is, right? So if we wanted to find that out, we would either, if we wanted to know for sure what the mean average was for all of these children in these other areas, we would have to test every child. Alternatively, if we don't have the resources to do that, we would then do a sample instead. We might test 50 or 100 or 1,000 of these children, 1,000 of these, say, population of 50,000 children. That's called a sample. When you're only taking a selection from a population and using that to derive, to, to infer uh, information about the population, that's called taking a sample. Okay, so we have a population and we have a sample. Um, now, when we talk about statistics that involve populations, we're going to use Greek letters. So if I talk about the average for uh, uh, average age of Americans from the census, since that's the entire population, I would use the Greek letter mu. If I take a sample of 100 people from the United States and, to, and describe to you the average age for those 100 randomly selected people, I would use X bar, and X with a bar over the top of it, to indicate that's a statistic, not a population uh, mean, right? And we call a population mean a parameter. So parameters use Greek letters because they they apply to a population and uh, 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 normal our normal letters for statistical uh, 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 values like like mean for instance. I, I'm trying to avoid other names of uh, uh, statistical uh, parameters. Okay, so um, okay, so okay, uh, so you know, there's all sorts of ways to display and use statistics and so on and so forth. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at ways to tabulate data. Uh, so here's a here's a, a method that we might use to uh, 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 describe a uh, listing of uh, uh, preferred cities and so on and so forth. Uh, we uh, here's a uh, basically a line graph 
that shows on the on the, uh, the y-axis it shows the year and on the x-axis it shows the num the mortality the number of deaths per uh, I can't read it myself per thousand population during that year and you can see like the mortality rates uh, over overall have been going down I'll show you an interesting version of this that's on the uh, annual uh, 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 Mortality, 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 and morbidity uh, summaries that the city puts out as well, where they include data that's right up to the right up to current date, uh, almost up to current date. So you can see when there have been cholera outbreaks and there's been spikes in mortality and so on and so forth. So that's an interesting way to display data. And one of the things we're going to be looking at today is that, in a lot of ways. Uh, you can tabulate data, you can summarize data by tabulating it by other methods, but you can also display it graphically. And sometimes when you display it graphically, you have a lot of advantages because at a glance, you can see, for instance, here that the mortality rates in New York are declining uh, uh, significantly. Um, um, okay, so um, uh, 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 inferential statistics, what we do is we take samples and we, based on those samples, we make an inference about the population, what the population uh, is. So, for instance, here you have, it's a little bit, it's a little bit fuzzy. I don't know if your version of it is any better than mine. It's a little bit fuzzy, but what you see here is Trump approval ratings, uh, of average, uh, basically it's the average of multiple different polls. There's a site online where you can actually get this data. Um, and if you look at this, you see this red line is disapproval, the green line is approval. Actually, I think it goes up quite a bit after that. It converges a little bit. But you see that kind of yellow area around it? That is what we call a 95% confidence interval for the mean of each one of the readings on this line. So that's kind of a level of uncertainty. So what we're inferring, what we're doing here is we're inferring that the approval rating is uh, the average approval rating on different polls is this number, but then there's a level of uncertainty. So we can only be really sure that the that the 90, that we can only be 95% sure that the real approval rating is say between 35 and 40 or something like that, right? Because of this range that we have here. So when we're making an inference based on it from about a population from a sample, there's always going to be the issue of is there error involved? How, how certainly do we know that this sample really reflects the true population mean? Okay, and sadly, we're never going to know, almost inevitably, never going to know the population mean. We never really find that out. We're always, almost always in statistics in public health, we're almost always working with a statistic and uh, trying to infer what the population mean is without ever really being, uh, uh, being certain of what it absolutely is is it hot in here or is it at me it's so hot. yeah okay <clears throat> See, I, can, I can hear the air conditioning running okay so maybe uh, i'll tell you what we're going to take two breaks today kind of go out into the hallway and cool off a little bit okay so all right so what are we why are we interested in this there's a lot of reasons why uh, we would be interested in this because we want to know whether a treatment works we want to know whether public health dollars are better spent in one area or another area and so on and so forth. Is cycling in the city becoming more dangerous? Anybody have an opinion on that? Is it more dangerous than it was? Anybody seen any studies on that yet? What's that? Oh, no kidding. Okay, so you see more, you're seeing more accidents. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I guess anytime you see cycling go up, you're gonna see that kind of thing. And uh, 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 there's a big debate in Queens right now about uh, uh, about uh, bike lanes that they're putting on a major boulevard in Queens, on uh, Queens Boulevard. Yeah, and and the the interesting thing is is that is that they're not being utilized very much. But the argument is one argument is they're not utilized very much. We're going to not continuous yet, right? The other argument is nobody's using them, so why are they put them there? And there's all the whole other issue of like. There's cross traffic and cars go into the bike lanes anyway, and people don't use the bike lanes even though they're there. Or the wrong I literally was driving into work. Some guy was riding up to Queens Boulevard bike lane in the wrong direction, of course. So, so there's all sorts of issues with that. Okay, so let's talk about the type of data again. Nominal data. 
nominal data is names basically right so so it could be gender male or female it could be uh left-handed or right-handed uh the funny characteristic about the two i just mentioned was that they are binary or dichotomous there's only two values there's a lot of things like that for instance disease or no disease hiv positive or hiv negative there's a lot of nominal data that turns out to be binary so that's kind of a little special subcategory and then nominal, a lot of times uh, a nominal data will be called categorical when instead of two categories, male or female, you have multiple categories, say eye color, for instance, or, uh, or uh, 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 a model of car, you know, model, model of car and so on. So, so uh, nominal data is one class of data, right? Uh, ordinal data, blood types are categorical, right? A, B, C. And by the way, Notice that here, where in, for instance, uh, a binary data, we're calling, uh, we're using zero for male, one for female, zero for alive, one for dead, uh, blood type zero for A, one for B, three for AB, four for O, and so on. A lot of times we translate nominal data into simple numbers, into integers. And the reason why we do that is because it's much easier to input that into a computer. Uh, fewer keystrokes, for instance, and it's much harder to make a mistake on entry. So, for instance, computers don't understand male, M-A-L-E, versus M-A-I-L. So if you make a typo, they're not going to recognize it. Uh, if you use upper and lower case, they may not recognize it as being the same thing. So it's just more efficient and safer to say, let's use zero for male and one for female. So a lot of times you'll see us doing that. Same thing for blood types. Uh, zero represents A, one represents B, three represents A, B, four represents O. Those numbers are not really numbers. They're still nominal data. They still represent a name, right? So even though they're numbers. Okay, ordinal data. Okay, again, this is like, for instance, a performance scale. Uh, uh, this is a, a level of uh, uh, disability. Uh, zero, fully active. One can do light work. Two can do no work. Uh, ambulatory, 50, more than 50% of the time three ambulatory less than 50% of the time and four completely disabled. Uh, and these numbers represent categories. They're not really a number. Three is uh, uh, three represents ambulatory, not really the number three. However, in this case, the order makes a difference, right? It's just like categorical data, except the order makes a difference. As the number gets higher, the level of disability gets higher. Would you quantify three the difference between three, two, and three be to be different than the difference between three and four? Well, no, you really can't categorize. You can just say one is worse than the other. Okay, so that's what ordinal data is, really a form of categorical data. Okay, uh, numerical data. This is actually actual real numbers. For instance, uh, 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 heart disease, number, number of deaths due to heart disease, cancer, those are, that's numerical data. However, Listing the leading causes of death is ordinal. In other words, what is ignore those numbers, right? Ignore those those uh, six-digit numbers and say to yourself, well, uh, let's list the leading causes of death. Well, first is heart disease, second is cancer, three is chronic lower respiratory, four is stroke, five is accidents. It's categories, categories of disease, and you can see which one is the highest category, which is the lowest category. Uh, but if you look closely. The difference between cancer and heart disease is way different than the difference between cancer and chronic lower respiratory. Even though if we didn't know those numbers, they would appear to be the same kind of differences. So we don't make any judgments about uh, the quantity, the, the, the relative value, just that one is a different, that they're in a different order. Again, ordinal data. And we analyze ordinal data a little bit differently than we analyze plain categorical data. Okay, discrete data. Discrete data is anything that you do. Uh, uh, discrete data, it, discrete data, and continuous data, the kind of faded thing you see next, is numerical data. The only difference between continuous numerical data and discrete numerical data is discrete data refers to integer data, things you can count. Okay, as I, when I was in college, a couple of us got uh, jobs working for some believe it or not, detective agency. 
that would do, uh, they would camp that one of their, one of their clients was a major theater chain in New York. And uh, what they would do is the owners of the theater, of the franchise theater, the owners of the theater would pay the film companies based on how many people saw the film, right? So they would send them a, a release, there'd be big reels and stuff like that to get delivered to them. And then they would show it on Friday night, Saturday night, three performances this night, four this night, so on and so forth. And then they would report back their ticket sales to the uh, film companies and they would have to pay per person that saw the film. The only problem is, of course, they would cheat, right? And, and, and uh, they would pay us to sit outside the box office and count how many people, a little counter, you know, little, these little round counters, you could hit it with your thumb, count how many people were actually going into the theater that night. So they can compare it to the numbers that the theater was referring to, was actually referring to. So at any rate, that's discrete data. It's an actual count. So an actual count could be a census, could be so on and so forth. A lot of, a lot of I think I actually have some. So, yeah, discrete, like number of people, that number of case, actual cases of heart disease, for instance. Uh, leading causes of death. Yeah, so 12,000. Now, those are really big integers, really big integers like that. We're going to treat them like numeric, scale or numerical data. Anyway, a lot of times, the, the, the kind of discrete data we're usually handling a little bit differently may be smaller integer data. So, for instance, the number of siblings in a family, number of uh, 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 dependents you have on your taxes, and so on. That'd be one, three, five, seven, and so on and so forth. That's what we would typically describe as discrete or integer data. Continuous data is going to be stuff like, you know, how many minutes uh, you can work on a treadmill, uh, what your weight is, what your BMI is, uh, length of a baby, uh, uh, gestation period, uh, uh, length of a pregnancy, uh, mass, body mass index, for instance, and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's, it's bounded. It can only be within a certain range. Sometimes it's continuous. There's a continuous scale, but it's a scale. And the difference between one number really means something in terms of another number. The difference between uh, 10 minutes and 30 minutes is the same as the difference between 20 minutes and 20 minutes and 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. Summarization of data. This is really what we're doing here. That's why, that's why it says very, very important here. We're, 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 we're doing this because we want to understand large data sets. We want to understand what they mean. And if we just see a page full of numbers, it's very difficult to interpret that. Uh, so we want to figure out how to summarize that data so we can use, understand that data and use it meaningfully. Okay, so for every data set we want to uh, we want to analyze seriously, we're gonna we're gonna find some way to 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 uh, uh, summarize it either numerically, in some cases with tables, with graphs, or maybe with graphical summary. Okay, what are examples of like you know think ways we would display this data? So for instance, with uh, nominal data or with ordinal data, we might use let's say something like a pie chart. Anybody see, anybody see anything wrong with that pie chart? We, go, we went out of way that, I mean, this is classic, right? 87% yes, 20 Now, I don't know who did that, but they, I don't think they took a statistics course, right? So, okay. So the other thing we can do is with nominal data or ordinal data, frequently we just put together frequency tables. We count how many males, how many females, and we put that in a table. So for instance, in the clinical trial, we might describe 50 people in treatment, 50 people in control. Severity might be, mild, moderate, severe, 20, 30, and 50. Now this data may come from a list where patient number one was mild, patient number two is moderate, moderate, severe, moderate, moderate, mild. So if you just look at that list of numbers, you really won't recognize that the largest number of people in this group are in the severe category. But if you summarize it into a table, now it's more meaningful. Uh, this is a, a, a cross tab or a contingency table, right? And so with this, we can actually kind of start to uh, uh, understand uh, uh, how many people in the control group uh, in the control group were uh, severe uh, had had severe symptoms. How many people in the treatment group had severe symptoms? And those values on the edge there, the edge up, they call them perimeter values, and they help us figure this out. So, for instance, in the control group, 30 out of 50 people, or 60 percent of the people, were uh, uh, were in this were in severe category. In the treatment group, 20 out of 50. Uh, or uh, or a lower percentage 
were uh, had severe symptoms. So whatever they're doing seems to be working a little at least. Okay, so we're able to deduce that from this information only, you know, because we were able to summarize it in a way that made it obvious to us. So that's that's one of the things that we're interested in doing. Uh, uh, also at frequency, we often display data as uh, uh, in bar charts. So for another word, so treatment, just as we had this table, treatment and control, equal numbers, mild, moderate, severe, unequal numbers, we can display that graphically. It's even easier to see sometimes in, uh, in a graph. So we can see the bottom graph, we can see the relative difference in moderate versus severe versus mild uh, uh, symptoms. Okay, another, another type of, uh, we can see in this one, a stacked bar chart. We can see that uh, for the control group, the proportion of people that, that still had severe, that had severe symptoms is lower than the proportion in the treat, treatment group. And we can see that at a glance. And this is, I presume this is after they had treatment. I guess otherwise it wouldn't mean anything, again, um, except for the fact that it wasn't a very good sample. So now, in order to work with continuous or discrete data, it gets a little bit more complicated because the numbers, for instance, can have almost any value. So for instance, um, uh, can you have a blood pressure that's between 80 and 85? Yeah, sure. Can you have blood pressure that's between 80 and 81? What does that represent? That's, that represents millimeters of mercury, right? Pressure, right? Uh, it's column mercury that's important. Can you have a, a, a blood pressure between 80 and 80, uh, 80 and 81? Yeah, you can. You could have 81 and a half. Most people don't record that, right? Because they're reading it off something that's not that easy to distinguish between those, right? But you could have 80.5. Could you have 80.05679? Of course you could, right? Because it's a continuous scale. Just it, We're just making it convenient and calling it 80 or 81, right? So continuous data can get a little bit sloppy that way. So what we try and do is we try and turn it into a little bit more like discrete data to make it easier to display. That's called this. I mean, I can't pronounce this. Discrete, 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 discretation, discretate. Uh, don't worry about it. it. Doesn't matter what they call it. But it's making it into kind of a, making uh, continuous data into something that can be quantified more discreetly. Okay, and we do that by setting up bins instead of talking about you know 81 or 82. We say blood pressures between 80 and 85, and blood pressures between 86 and 90, and blood pressures between 90. And then we say to ourselves, let's put all of the people that are between those two numbers in each one of these bins or categories. Well, that allows us to uh, summarize the data something like this as a as a kind of special kind of bar chart, which is called a histogram. Okay, and if you look closely. At this histogram, I'm gonna. Uh, it's the same thing here, but I'm gonna go to this one. If you look closely at this histogram, um, each one of these, like that first little, that that first little, uh, the, the uh, from 20 to 30, we have two bars, right? So it's really 20 to 25 and 25, 26 to 30, basically, or 25.001 to 30. The minute you get over 25, you go into the next bar, right? So so. So in other words, a person is, there's one person that's between 20 and 25. There are three people that are between, uh, and notice this is frequency, the number of people. There's three people, three subjects that are between 25 and 30. There are something like 25 people that are between 45 and 50, and so on and so forth. And these bars describe this sample, describe the, 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 uh, the distribution of this sample. This is eventually going to become a pretty familiar shape to you because it's not uncommon for uh, public health data, for uh, 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 human data, so on and so forth, to kind of display this way. Like, for instance, if this were a person's temperature, body temperature, right? We know the average body temperature is about 99 degrees, right? So we would expect most people to have a body temperature around 98, 99 degrees, right? Maybe uh, maybe some people 97, maybe some people 100, maybe some people, I mean, their normal body temperature. But as we get close, as we get further and further away from that kind of normal value, that average value that most people have, fewer and fewer people are gonna be included 
in these bars. So we get kind of this natural distribution that we're going to talk about later on. So, but this lets us see how the width of this distribution and where the middle of this distribution is. So we get a, a really pretty good feel of what the level of severity is for this sample or population, whatever it represents. Uh, anybody know, what's, it, what's one of the other physical differences that you see between a bar chart and a histogram here? See, there, uh, let me go back to histogram. Did I have it? There's a bar chart, right? See the bar charts there? There's a histogram. There's a histogram. Ain't notice anything different that catches your eye about this? The spaces between the uh, bars, right? Why aren't there any spaces in the histogram? Because it's continuous. You're either going to fall into one or flop into the next one. So that range encompasses everybody between the top end of this bar and the bottom end of this bar. That's irrelevant for nominal data, right? Because that could be just their color, you know, green, blue, what, brown, so on and so forth, right? So, so histograms are not going to have spaces in between them. That has something to do with the physically what they are. So you get an idea. You can see like relatively what levels of uh, 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 how many people have severe symptoms, mild symptoms, and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 this is called a frequency polygon. If you made, you can actually just pick the middle value here and then make the bars behind it disappear. And you have kind of a summary of where the middle values for each bar are. Okay. And uh, if we, if we uh, smooth out this curve, we get a probability density distribution. Not worry about that for now. Okay. And then there's another way of displaying this data that's called a box plot. And a box plot represents the minimum value to the maximum value. So I'm going to see this little circle here. I'm going to ignore that for a second. Uh, if that little circle weren't there, typically what this feather, we call that a feather, what this feather would represent is the highest value. And what this feather would represent is the lowest value. And the dark bar here would represent the median. In this case, they use median. For box plots, they happen to use median instead of mean. That would be the median. Median is the middle value, right? Half the people are below that, half the people are above that. What do we call that in percentiles? What percentile would that be? Right? Half the people are above, half the people are above. That's the 50th percentile, right? So if you scored on the GREs, if you scored in the top 10% or the ninth, the tenth percentile, Right, or the 90th percentile. That would mean 90% of the people scored lower than you, 10% of the people scored higher than you. So the median, the middle value, is the 50th percentile. Right? So, so this is the this is the bottom, this is the top, and this box here, the lower end of this box, represents the 25th percentile, meaning between here and here, 25%, 25th percentile to the 50th percentile, 25% of the people are in this area of this chart here, right? And the median to this top part is the 20, 50th to the 75th percentile. So between here, the 25th percentile, and the 75th percentile, you have 50% of the people that are in this sample, right? 50% of the people are between here and here. So that has got a special name. They call that the interquartile range. Right, so that gives you an idea. If you look at this box plot, you can see well, half of the people are between this value. If you look at the number scale, we'll also move the number scale up here. 50% of the people are between here and here. And then 25% are below that, 25% are above that. Anybody know what this little dot out here is? Notice how this tail stretches out a little bit further? That's because there was somebody in this study that had a very low severity that they reported much lower than everybody else. That's called an outlier, right? Most programs have some technical definition of what an outlier is, right? So for instance, SPSS, by default, SPSS says an outlier is anything that's more than one and a half interquartile ranges from the 25th percentile. So that was so far away that instead of putting a line here, it just put that outside there and said, let's ignore that guy there. I put that there. Technically, when you're actually deciding whether to keep a person that's an outlier, 
right? You might say to yourself, well, I really have to justify that and see why he's an outlier. Maybe it's an, a, an error in data entry, who knows, right? You have to analyze why that is. It just happens, SPSS, a lot of the software programs use that kind of like general rule, but it's just a construct. You don't have to, you, you don't necessarily have to do it that way. You really have to analyze it a little bit more severely. And in SPSS, other statistical programs, you can set up your own rule for what you call an outlier as well. But look, so it's a nice graphics I forgot about. It. And this is a special kind of scatter plot where each individual person, their value is kind of stacked up here. And you can see again, this lets you know that most of the people are in this range. Okay, and it's kind of a mashup of all these different kinds of ways to look at this box plot and so on and so forth. Okay, so basically that's the first look that we have at how we're gonna summarize data. Okay, let's take a break. When we come back, I'll entertain you with a little bit of my history in statistics and some interesting anecdotes. Anecdotes, okay? So it's 2.22, what do you say we break until about 2.30 or so? Okay, 2.32, something like that, 10 minutes. Okay, leave the door open so we get some air in here. Okay, and for you guys that are online, um, if you are online and not in the classroom right now, um, uh, 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 who is that? Let me see who that is. Paige, can you make me the presenter? Yes, I can make you the presenter. Do I have a reason why I want to make you the presenter? I know you asked that question a while ago, but if you're still there. Okay, and while, uh, while, while I'm at it, uh, uh, if you are online and not in class, could you type your name into the chat box so I can use it as attendance? In case you missed it, I'm required to let the registrar know that you are attending the class. You do not have to be physically in the class at any time. The exams will be on, online, um, uh, but I do have to acknowledge that you are attending the class in one form or another in order to make sure you get your, uh, your financial assistance and so on and so forth. So type in your name in the chat box so I know that you're attending. If you're not physically in class to sign a attendance sheet. Okay, and I won't be taking attendance in the future. It's just the first week or two I can confirm that you're actually attending. Hi, you're standing and you're looking at me. That's threatening, you know, it got me worried now. Yes? Well, let me pause this so you, these people don't have to hear this. Hang on a second. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I think for the most part, we're mostly back. Um, okay, guys, I'm going to pass around this attendance sheet. Please make sure you sign it before you leave today. So I'll start. You guys want to start over there? You, go. you can hold on to that with it. Just make sure we get that back. That's a very valuable pen. <laughs> we have to order another case of, uh, uh, of uh, penicillin from that drug company. Uh, yeah, I imagine. Okay, guys. So uh, let me pick up where we left off, except now I'm going to take this from the perspective of a lab. And in the lab, we're going to be taking advantage of 
software programs that are going to help, help us do statistical calculation, help us display data, help us summarize, organize data. Okay, so I'm going to start the slideshow here. Okay, so you guys see where when I took statistics at Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn on J Street in 1966 or 67. I don't remember for sure. It's my freshman year, right? So 60 between 66 and 67. When I took the course, that's what I used. That machine that you see there is an electronic calculator, mechanical electronic calculator. Um, before that, they used to have cranks on full of cranks on them and so on. They actually built a motor into this one. That This machine you see in the picture will add columns and numbers. How many digits? Six, eight, ten digit numbers. Uh, it'll add them, subtract them, multiply, divide them. There are versions of this that would actually do, actually square them and do some of the squares as well, more sophisticated versions of this. They happen to have them. Uh, but this is literally what taking statistic looks like in 1967. Okay, now we also we use slide rules back in those days. Probably most of you have probably never seen the slide rules. Kind of an analog computer uses uh, moving scales. Eventually, we started to see electronic calculators show up. This one is a little bit later than the first one I saw. The first one I saw was probably around 1967 also. It was made by a company called Wang. They're still around somewhere. I actually, the, uh, the, uh, the president of Wang, used to own the uh, Nassau Coliseum, I think, right? And the Islanders. But at any rate, uh, Wang um, made the first um, one of these electronic calculators that I saw use Nixie tubes, these big tubes about that big and the numbers had wires in them and stuff. And we not we as students were not allowed to touch them. We, had, we could look at them, they had those little windows with the wire in them and stuff. We could look at them through the little windows. With the wire in them, we weren't allowed to touch them. As we weren't allowed to touch computers at all, we didn't have workstations. Uh, we would do our computer programs by uh, by typing up these Hollerith cards, these cards called Hollerith cards. They were about that big, yay big, about four inches by about 10 inches. And we would use a machine would poke holes into them. And they would go into a card reader, which would read the positions and holes and translate that into letters and numbers. And uh, we would stack those up, leave them at the computer room, and come back the next day, get our printouts and our cards back after it ran the program. Okay, so so uh, that's things have come a long way since then. But they didn't come a long way all at once. Okay, so typically the way people track numbers and and other kinds of information back in those days is to basically make ledgers, make lists of columns and numbers. Uh, in uh, uh, in accounting, they use literally use something called a ledger, a ledger book, in which it had a whole series of columns and rows and so on and so forth. Just, just as you see in the yellow side of this is yellow paper on the side. Uh, anybody here in, uh, into accounting at all? Heard of double entry bookkeeping? Well, you know, with accounting, when you keep information on a ledger, like for instance, accounts receivable, how much somebody owes you, uh, you make an entry, you know, you ship something, make an entry, they owe you this, now they owe you this, and so on and so forth. When you do that, the problem is you're doing it in ink and you can't really go back easily and make corrections. So double entry bookkeeping, what you would do is instead of going back and removing an invoice, you would add a credit in a different column and all up at the bottom of the page. You take those numbers to the bottom of the page, go to the top of the next page, put them down as your starting point, keep working through this. And it was very cumbersome, difficult way to handle stuff. It would have been really nice if you could do this on a computer. Right, and right next to that, you get kind of first view of kind of like what this might look like on a computer. You know, I want to see if I can't play this video. Um, one class of software that we're going to be using is called spreadsheet program. In our case, that spreadsheet program is called Excel. Excel has really kind of taken over the market. There were many hundreds of other spreadsheet programs around before. Uh, they basically got driven out of business by Microsoft. There was one, uh, there was a Lotus one, two, three, there was Multiplan, there was just dozens and dozens of them. But the first example of a spreadsheet program, basically the invention of a spreadsheet program on a microcomputer was a couple of these damn Bricklin, and I'm trying to remember the other guy's name. Maybe it gets mentioned here. Let's see if I can't play this video for you. Okay, so now I'm going to have to turn on the sound. Okay, don't know how well this is going to work online, but we'll see. 
sounds up and I gotta turn sound up here. Okay, this is either gonna be a disaster or it's gonna actually work. The Apple II set a new can you standard. Hear, you can't hear that, right? I know why you can't hear that. Because it sounds like a few. See if this works. Small computers and show their. Okay, so it should pick up the sound from here. Computer audio. Oops, leaning on this thing. Should be able to hear that. Real money to be made. Rival. Uh. I'm gonna have to do a little bit. I'll figure out something. Uh, just for now, I'll show you later. When I get, a, we'll take another break, and I'll, uh, which I think would be a good idea in this temperature anyway. Okay, let me get back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so these guys, these two guys invented the first uh, computer spreadsheet. Okay, now we're going to play around with uh, Excel, the first computer spreadsheet. We're going to notice it's a lot of special properties that it has that give it a lot of advantages over a uh, ledger. Not the least of it is, is that you can make corrections in it and it will, it will automatically update any calculations that were done from that point on. It's a great way to to store data, make lists and so on and so forth. It's a great way to manipulate data, sort it, to perform operations on it and so on and so forth. And as it happens, it has a lot of specific statistical functionality built right into it. So we're gonna take a look at that. The other kind of uh, program that we're gonna look at, uh, just which you can discuss, not really work with today, is a database program. Database programs are programs that are specifically intended to handle data, to take lists of data, to sort them, to be able to locate information on them, so on and so forth. The, things like Oracle, uh, FileMaker Pro, Fox Pro, these are programs that are called database programs. They're, they can take enormous amounts of information and data and help you store it, handle it, sort it, locate it, search it, so on and so forth. Right, so those are called database programs. The third kind of software that we're going to be looking at today is called uh, 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 it's called a statistical program, or in our case, it's going to be SPSS. Okay, and that program, funny, I don't have a title on it. Says SPSS, but anyway, SPSS is a specific kind of software that's designed to do statistical calculations. A lot of people call that vertical software. It's software that's specifically designed to do one job very well. Excel does many jobs well. It has financial uh, 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 functionality built into it. It's got engineering functionality. It's got trigonometry uh, functions. It's got all sorts of other things built into it that you can take advantage of. You can use it for budgeting, for all sorts of stuff. Uh, SPSS is only good at one thing. It's a vertical software. Uh, at work, if you do medical billing, you have probably use a software program that you're not going to use to to create uh, documents or projects or graphics, but it's really good at identifying categories of uh, uh, procedures and so on and doing billing and so on and so forth. It's vertical software. So SPSS is a form of vertical software. So we're going to be using Excel. We're going to be using SPSS as our main tools. In addition to that, since we actually have to communicate a lot of this information to other people, we're also going to be using a word processing program like Word. It's up to you which one you want to use. Most people have Excel on their computers. It's part of that Microsoft package. 
Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. I, they, have, they have student discounts for it. You may even be able to find a way to get it through your Hunter ICID, uh, particularly cheaply. Uh, at cheaply. Um, uh, SPSS, as I told you before, uh, normally it's like a $45 purchase for a six month license. It appears that we're gonna be able to download it for free, but I'll get, fill you in on that information in a little bit. We're not gonna use it until next week, so we're not in that much of a hurry yet. Okay, so again, types of data that we're gonna work with. The reason why I bring this up again now is because as it happens, these different types of data that I described that I broke down painfully into different little subcategories like dichotomous, categorical, ordered, uh, integer, discrete. So SPSS really only categorizes data in three forms, nominal, so categorical, nominal, it doesn't care if it's binary or, or categorical. Uh, scalar, which is any kind of number scale. And ordinal, which we saw is that kind of special version of categorical. Those are the only three identifiers that SPSS is going to worry about. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be concerned at all about these other kinds of data descriptions. Uh, uh, but as far as SPSS is concerned, we're going to stick with those three particular descriptions. Now, remember I mentioned that if you're dealing with a, uh, you guys want to close the door there? It will help if the, on the noise. You know what you might do also at the, at the risk of, risk of putting everybody to sleep, you might want to turn off the lights because it's easier to see. I know this is crappy. They never seem to change the bulb in these things, but I don't know how many of you guys are actually looking up front rather than your computer screens. Most of you looking at your computer screens? Well, then leave the light on. Okay, so, yeah. what's that? You'd rather have it off? Leave it off. Okay, no problem. If I hear snoring, I'll, I'm gonna stop. Okay, so at any, rate, at any rate, I mentioned to you before that when we're dealing with a population, we use Greek letters. A couple of the uh, this statistical descriptive statistics that we're going to use are mean, for instance, the average with numerical data. We talk about the average all the time. Then we talk about the variability. So we literally use for statistics, we use X, X bar and X with a bar over the top of it to describe the average, the arithmetic average. We use uh, variability to describe the variability. We use SD or standard deviation to describe the spread. Those same numbers, when we identify it with a population, we use Greek letters, mu, which is a little circle, sigma, uh, I'm sorry, mu is a, a kind of a U, uh, sigma, which is kind of a little circle, and then other things, chi, we have this thing called a chi-square analysis that we use, that looks like a capital X, with a little two, a little superscript two, okay, but, and again, we looked at the summer, we looked at these, oh, here's, here's various kinds of bar charts, here's a whiskey bar chart, there's a candy bar chart. There's a sushi bar chart. Okay. So anyway, these are the, this is typically what these would look like. And here's, for instance, an example of a box plot. If you look on the right here, the, uh, the uh, uh, box plot that's represented here, the lowest value here, this, is, this represents tree diameters, is what this really is. And this looks like it's representing this, uh, this, this, the red maple that's over here that doesn't get, that gets full sun, right? The red maples that get full sun, well, looks, it looks like the, the smallest diameter after a certain number of years is, is about 11. And the thickest diameter is, looks like about 18 inches, right? All the others are between those two, except for one tree, which has a diameter of 24 inches. Who knows, that's an outlier, right? Who knows why that's an outlier? Could be maybe uh, it was misidentified. It's not really a red maple, it's a sugar maple or something like that. But we'd have to go back and figure that out. But generally our range of values are between, it looks like about 11 and 18, right? And we can see that 50% of the trees are between about uh, 13 and 16 inches in diameter. That's our interquartile range. Remember 25th percentile, 50th percentile, our median value is 15 inches. That means half of the trees are thicker than 15 inches, half of the trees are thinner than 15 inches. So this box plot gives us a look at that in, at a glance. Okay, why is that valuable? Well, let's take a look at this. If we go over here to this and we look at red maples that uh, grew in full sun and part sun, as it happens in that particular species, it looks like they grow better in part sun than they do 
in full sun. Uh, unlike that, uh, for sugar maples, it looks like, number one, there's much more variability than there is in red maples, and it looks like the mean value, the median value, half of the trees uh, uh, are greater than 28 inches in diameter if they grow in full sun, and half are, uh, half are uh, 24 inches or larger if they grow in part sun. So we can see various effects of these distributions, the spread, the middle and the spread of these, uh, and compare them. Uh, it's just simply a, a glance. Another way that we display data when we have numerical data, for instance, uh, if we're taking couples and we're examining if there's an association between a husband's age and a wife's age, right? So well, let's see, how would we display that uh, uh, graphically? Well, what we've done here is each one of these points represents an X and a Y axis for that particular point, an X and a Y value for that particular point. So in other words, this particular person over here, the husband's age appears to be about 52 and the wife's age appears to be about 63, right? So that coordinate, that X and Y coordinate uh, means that uh, that dot has that X and Y coordinate showing that association between husband and wife's age. And in general, this lets us see that there's an, a strong association between husband's age and wife's age, right? So obviously fake data, it's not, it's, it's a little bit too linear, right? But this, at a glance, we can see that there's a strong association between these two numbers. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna get some hands-on practice with Excel and maybe even a little bit with X, SPSS eventually. So what I'm gonna do now is, if you've had a chance to, you might consider or if you haven't had a chance, you might consider downloading the files that are on Blackboard. I'm going to go to Blackboard right now. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. If you go into weekly, uh, weekly material. Okay. Were you able to get log on back there? Okay, good. Okay. If I click on that enough, it'll come up eventually. Here's week one. Oh, it's spinning. If you go into the weekly material, go into the lab folder. Come on. Uh, here we go. Go into the lab folder, or you actually it's listed. It's, you don't even have to go any further. Uh, if you if you uh, can download these uh, these first few files one two three one uh, cell cell demo cell function demo two budget demo three graphic demo so on and so forth. Down, download the first I guess uh, four or five of those so that we can play around with them together. While I'm here. Okay, while I'm here, oh, you know, I think I know why it wasn't working. Okay, I'll, I can fix that later. Uh, while I'm here, I'm gonna go into the syllabus. I'm gonna go quickly over the syllabus because there are a few loose, loose ends here. And uh, go to, to the course materials as well. The course materials. Okay, first thing I want to bring up is there's something called a city program certificate. City program is an organization that uh, runs a, uh, uh, a certificate based program on ethics in human research. And uh, 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 they have uh, agreements with different universities and medical facilities and so on and so forth to provide these this kind of training and a certificate for people that work or are in, uh, learning at those institutions. CUNY has a, a, a setup with them. So what we need you to do, this say take this course kind of as a point where in the future you might actually be doing some work with uh, uh, data uh, uh, that you're collecting from humans or, or data that uh, 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 has been collected from humans. Uh, they, in order for you to be involved in any studies that uh, 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 at Hunter, 
that might impact uh, uh, human health or safety or privacy, they need you to complete a certificate program. Okay, it's a basic course, basic program in uh, ethics and human research. Uh, if you log on there, when you create a log on, you can go to an area where it's going to ask you what institution that you're associated with, and you'll find City University of New York or CUNY. And when you go into that, it'll give you a, 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 a bunch of selections on which version that you're interested in. Okay, and typically for most of you, that's going to be graduate student, and it's going to be a basic course in ethics and human, uh, human subjects research. Okay, and it's going to have about, I think, about 10 or 12 modules. Each module consists of a few pages of reading or video, and then it's going to have like a four or five question quiz. Uh, as you go, as you complete the first module, then you can go on to the next and the next and the next. You need to get over 80 percent average overall, not in all that you don't have to get 80 percent on all of the modules. You can go back as much as you want, retake the test. But we need each of you to complete that. And I'll give you a spot at the end. You'll be able to print out a certificate. I'll give you a spot on Blackboard where you can upload it. So we know you have. Now, if you've done this course in the past year, if you have a certificate that you've gotten in the past 12 months, you can upload that instead. You don't have to do it. If you've done it, if you haven't done it in more than 12 months, you can take an abbreviated version, a recertification, abbreviated version, and upload that instead. Okay, how many of you have already done this, the city program course? Okay, for work or for, uh, or for I'm sorry. Oh, okay, good. So they, they wanted to make sure you had it. Did they ask if you had done it and, and then say what that was wrong at your staff professor and make you do it? Did, did they blame the statistics professor for people that didn't have it? Oh, okay. Usually they blame me. You know, if they don't have, if you don't have it, they blame me. So at any rate, that's okay. So, so at any rate, so we need you guys to have, so you can upload your version of it. Uh, if you've done it for another institution, like if you work at a hospital or something like that, uh, you can upload that again. It's got to be within the last 12 months. The theory being that if you're here for a few years, it takes you, it expires in three years. If you're here for a couple of years or three years, then we know that you at least have that. So if you're uh, involved in any stuff that, that requires uh, the IRB, then you're safe and you've been at training. Anybody know, what does IRB stand for? Anybody know? Except for the person that took the course. Anybody know what IRB stands it's a review board, right? It's, it's a research review board. Uh, in, or, in order to uh, uh, do any research that involves humans, you have to uh, uh, you have to present the the, uh, uh, the study design and the method of data collection and so on and so forth to the review board, so they can approve it, so they know that you whatever you're doing is ethical. So at any rate, let's okay. So at any rate, we'll move on from there. Okay, so you need to do that. Uh, you got the, the book, uh, spreadsheet software, uh, Excel, hopefully you'll be able to find it, uh, and SPSS. Again, on here is a link to download it to your computer and purchase it, a six-month license for about 45 bucks. If, if you wind up doing that, you want the standard version, preferably not the base version. But if you have a base version, we can work with it. But it'd be better if you have the standard version, about 45 bucks for a six-month license. Hold off on that until I can find out if we got a way to get it for free. So, and uh, now getting back to the syllabus, I'm not sure, are there any elements in the syllabus here that really stand out? Let me just, come on. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, we talked about my accessibility. Most of you want to get to get to me by email or through the discussions board. Again, we can uh, do some live online stuff. I'm doing stuff on Thursdays. I'll add that to Blackboard so that you can uh, uh, join me in uh, these online review sessions. Uh, uh, if you're really struggling, I can arrange some time, you know, FaceTime in real person. Or we can do it over the internet. We can do it uh, using GoToMeeting or Skype or something like that. The textbook, a lot of we already discussed the accessibility of the textbook. The SPSS you're going to hold off on. Okay, as far as grading is concerned, 40% of the uh, of the 
uh, of your grade is homework assignments. Uh, exam one and exam two each are 15%, and the final exam is 20%. Okay, now, typically, what, I'll, what I wind up doing is really kind of weighting them about 50% for all three exams if you wind up doing the exams instead. So like, you know, waiting the final project a little bit more because you're putting a little bit more into it if you wind up doing that. Um, um, again, they're non-cumulative. They're open book. You can do them online. And uh, but the only thing is, is you have to do your own work. Uh, 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 on the homework, it's perfectly OK to collaborate. Now, I have a special rule on the homework. In, in the syllabus, it describes that if you don't submit and you typically you'll have about a week to do the homework roughly a week maybe maybe occasionally if there's a holiday six six days or eight days or whatever it may vary a little bit typically you have about a week we're not talking about anything that should take you more than an hour or two uh, it's uh, you know uh, maybe if you struggle a little bit take a little bit more time however I, personally i think it's so important in this kind of course that you keep up that you don't like all of a sudden drop out or lag behind or struggle with something and then get left behind on this stuff. What I do with the homework is if you submit the homework by the due date, I don't care what score you have on it. You can get all the wrong answers. I don't care about it. If you submit the homework by the due date, at least in the effort to do the homework by the due date, any time in the semester, you can go back and improve your grade. You can do it. I had students do it 12 times. You know, they'll get 30%, 38%, 50%, and they'll eventually figure it out, get all the answers right, right? So if you submit it on time, the, the idea there is, is that I don't want you falling. I don't want you like just saying, oh, I, I can't do this, and you missed three homework assignments, and now we're on a completely different topic and stuff like that. I want you to at least try the homework. It also helps me because if I see that a lot of people are struggling on the homework, I know I have to go back and work on it. Where if they're not, if you're not submitting it, I don't know what the reason is. Could be you know, you're on vacation, you know, you drinking too much that week, I, you know, whatever. Could be a lot of reasons that that happens. But if I see that you can't get the answers right, you're trying it, but you can't get the answers right, it means a lot more to me. So what does that mean? That means if you submit the homework on time, right, even just an effort at the homework on time, you can get 100% on that 40% by going back and redoing, right? That's 40% of your grade. Think about that. You could trash an exam and be able to recover from that because you got that 40% in the bank. Okay. So that I really, really, it's really important to me that you guys keep up because it really will be a lot easier for you. And it's and this kind of course where you know you miss a few, you kind of fall, you kind of get discouraged and you fall back a few weeks and stuff like that, that it's just really hard and discouraging to catch up again. And I appreciate that. And I want to avoid you guys getting into that situation. So Keeping in mind, keep keeping in mind on that 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 like uh, even if you don't understand the stuff, try the homework anyway, and uh, make a submission, and then you can always go back and do better. But then I'll know that 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 that's happening. Okay, uh, that's not too much of this really is relevant to us because we're going to be doing this online. You can do it three ways. You can either be here, you can live online, you can watch live online as some people, a couple of people at least are doing it seems like. Let me click into the chat box here. I got at least one, yes, at least one person is watching this online, right? So so uh, that is Hojan, I think it is. Okay, so at least one person is watching this online. Um, or, or you can time shift it. And once these, the video of this is online, you can watch it at any time you want. Uh, and so on. But keep up, keep in mind, keep up with homeworks anyway, even if you wind up time shifting it a little bit later. Okay, and uh, let's see. And I'm counting on, on you to maintain your integrity on the exams so that we can do it that way. Otherwise, we're all going to have to figure out some way to everybody get in the same spot and be do, you know make things a lot nastier to trying to do this stuff. Okay, um, now these departments lately, I don't know if you've, you you encountered this. They are crazy where incompletes are concerned. They hate incompletes. Uh, in order to get an incomplete, whoops, let me close that. In order to get an incomplete, you need to get approval from your advisor and possibly the department head. Okay, so at all costs, try and avoid an incomplete. Uh, they'll only grant them in, you know, in, in, in certain circumstances like illness or you know some reason that maybe work takes you away from 
the city or something like this, something of that nature, right? So they're very reluctant to give out incompletes. Okay, freight appeals, you got all sorts of information on that. We do have a couple of things here. Let's see. Yeah, it's kind of funky, right? We have this class, we have this class on the 28th. We have where we meet again after Labor Day, and we have no class on the 11th and the 18th, if I'm correct with that. Anybody confirm that for me? Yeah, it looks right, right? We have no class on the so we go from se September 4th to sep 20, September 25th without any classes. Okay, so maybe I'll set up like somewhere in between there, I'll set up like an online session where if you guys wanna review something or stay a little bit sharper or something like that, that, uh, that we don't, we don't uh, completely forget everything that we learned in the first couple of weeks. Uh, exam one is currently scheduled for October 16th. Um, there's a conference, is there the American Public Health Association conferences in October? Does anyone go to that? Is anyone planning on going to that? Okay, good. Just want to make sure that like we don't have a conflict with an important conference. Um, 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 then after that, we have a whole series of other topics until the second exam, which is on November 27th. Uh, it, it says in this room, but it's really, you could do it online. Not a good deal. And it's, I got the wrong time there. I really need someone to prove this for me. I'm, I'm terrible at proving. Okay, and then we got these other dates. And then uh, finally, on December 18th, uh, we have exam three or, uh, uh, or presentation. for uploading a presentation of the final projects. We'll figure that out. If it looks like most people are coming in here, then we'll find a way for you to do something interesting in terms of like uh, how you uh, present your final project. When I say present, I mean, you know, tell us about it in five minutes and show us the the, uh, the, uh, what basically is going to be the, uh, the uh, poster. Okay, this describes the competencies we expect you to have it when we're all done with this. And this is just some extra stuff on statistical not notation so that when you see, you know, when you see me use different things like mu and this mu and this sigma, what it really looks like, and the sigma square, that's variance as it happens, and so on and so forth, and x bar, and you see me use various uh, 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 forms of notation that you have a res reference for it. And maybe it'll help you out. Uh, maybe make it a little less confusing. Maybe make it more confusing, maybe a little less. And so that's where we stand on that.